I do want to talk about chords. Um, last time we worked through this idea of the scale and how you can build triads on each of the members of the, uh, of the scale. And we talked about a triad being a configuration of three pitches where you take the first, the third, and the fifth. The, the first of the triad, this is a term that we'll be going over today, is called the what? The root of the triad. So if we have C, G, the C is the root of the triad. The lowest note of this aggregate of three is the root of the triad. So we can build triads on each of the members of the scale. And we said that some of these chords tend to be used a lot more than others, that the tonic is very important, the dominant is important, the subdominant right next to and below the dominant is important. We're going to be talking about the sixth chord today. We could give that a name. We could call it the submediant, but that's probably getting too technical. We'll just call it a six chord. So we got a one chord built on the first degree of the scale, a five chord built on the fifth degree of the scale, a fourth chord built on the uh, a four chord built on the fourth degree, and a six chord built on the sixth degree. Now I had an interesting discussion in section this past week uh, and a couple of uh, really good questions were asked. I started by saying could you come up with any kind of, well you tell me in 50 words or less what I said in lecture yesterday about harmony. How does harmony work? Can you come up with a visual image of how harmony works? So we tried out a couple of things. One of the things that we discussed was this type of imagery here, where you'd have vertically these pillars, if you will, or we could even call them more, I sort of looked at this sort of called them tree trunks almost. And these tree trunks were the chords. And at the base of each of these chords, at least conceptually, theoretically, is this thing called the root. So it, I, I like this tree metaphor here. So we've got the root here of the, and then the trunk, and then up above, of course, this florid canopy would musically be the what? The melody. Okay, so we might think about, think about that. Now, in the course of this, a student asked a very good question that I should have pointed out a long time ago, and that is when an orchestra plays or an ensemble plays, and they're, uh, they're looking at their mu music and they're reading their music, um, do they play a chord? The, does the violin play a chord? And are the trumpets, each trumpet playing a chord? And, and the viola, is it playing a chord? What do you think? No, it's just playing one note, one note of a chord, one note of a chord. And once again, we, our ears, hear this aggregate of sound and we say, oh, it's got that, 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 that. And we extrapolate out of that information that it is this particular chord. But if you were to, to look at what the uh, YSO has on its stands, nobody's playing a chord. They're just playing individual notes that all together form a chord. And we pointed out, however, that one individual has a, uh, the music that has all of these parts on it, and that, of course, is the conductor who has the full conducting score, the full score in front of him or her. So that was one interesting question that came up. So keep this in mind if you're wondering about this idea of chords. So we could say this is the root, maybe this is the third, and that's the fifth. These other instruments are filling in these things at various spots to produce this aggregate of the chord. Uh, supposing this, we mentioned this also, this idea, supposing we had other things kind of running around there. Without those other things running around, we would have a good sort of model of homophonic texture, sort of block chords changing in that fashion. If you put in other little strands of melody, it changes it more toward polyphonic texture. Uh, let's review another point, and I'll get to a second question that was asked. Why do we have to change chords? We talked about this last time. Why do we change chords? Yeah. Because the melody changes, and not all harmonies are concordant with every note. Someone asked me, well, why are some, why are some notes, why are some notes consonant, and why are other notes dissonant? And the, the answer has to do with ratios and string sizes and lengths of pipe and things like that. 
But generally speaking, pitches that are right next to each other, very close to each other, are dissonant. If you get a, a, a highly irrational ratio like 9 to 8, which is the whole tone, or, 17, or 18 to 9, 17, which is depending upon your into tuning is the half step, those uh, irrational ratios are very dissonant. Or that kind of sound. But if you allow a little space in there, let's say you go to a uh, 3 to 2 ratio or a 6 to 5, even a 6 to 5 ratio, it gets more consonant. Let's see how this would play out. Here, for example, we have the pitch C, and either note to above or below it is dissonant. These are very close together. Now let's play this on the piano. So here's a C. And if I play the D above it, it's dissonant. B below it, it's dissonant, but let's say I go down to the A below it, allowing a little separation between the two pitches now. What about that? Consonant or dissonant? Sounds a lot better. What about this? Go, now going down to the G against the C. Yeah, almost, sounds fine. Sounds well, kind of bland or revenue neutral there. What about this? Yeah, sounds sort of nice. What about this? Yeah, not so much. But if you think about it, so it's not that it, if you, it's not that we're allowing even more space here. What we've done is taken this pitch and, and played it all the way down an octave below it. So we're actually getting back to this configuration of the pitch right next to it. Uh, and we could then, of course, we could go down one more step, and we would get the octave, which is a, a duplication of two to one. So that's, that's a very wide sort of a ratio there. So that's something to think about. The closer these pitches are together, the more likely they are to be dissonant and the desire to have some space added there. Questions about that? Okay, uh, let's go on now to uh, talk about a chord progression. Anybody want to do, what's your understanding of what a chord progression is? If I said chord progression, I think we have that term up on the board today. What is a chord progression? Uh, let's see. You gonna? Yeah, fire away. Uh, nice and loud, a little bit louder. I couldn't hear it. Okay, good, excellent. A sequence of chords that sound good together, that kind of make sense together. We could say that sort of march along in a full <laughs> fashion. make sense together, all right? They, they seem to be going somewhere. And there's this sort of force of pull or gravity in music having to do with uh, some chords wanting to go to other chords. Uh, so we've got a chord progression. We've talked about the root of a triad. The root of the triad is the bottom uh, most pitch of that triad. Supposing we didn't go C, E, G, but we decided to start with the E, G and put the C up on top. C, E, G, C. Well, that'd be what's called a chord inversion. We're not going to get into that because that takes us into heavy duty music theory, but it's if we don't have root position, then we've got some other note of the triad in the bass, and we've got some kind of chord inversion. So that's what that particular uh, term means up there. Uh, what are we going to do to hear these chords? How do we hear? How do we hear chord progressions? How do we hear harmony? What are we listening for again? Obviously, we've talked about it again, again, again. We're going to be listening for the bass, okay? And all of our musical experience tells us listen to melody. Melody is beautiful. That's what we want to hear. But now, to get a sense of harmony, we're going to listen to the bass. And we said last time we want to do two things. We want to figure out if the harmony is changing, and if it is changing, whether it's changing at a regular or irregular rate. By regular rate, we mean that the amount of time that each chord holds is exactly the same. Every chord holds for the same length of time. If one chord holds twice as long or only half as long, then we have an irregular harmonic change, irregular rate of harmonic change. So let's begin with our first example here this morning. It's from Richard Wagner. It's the beginning of his ring cycle. And we're going to listen to this. Well, how do we hear the bass? How do we tell if the, if the harmony is changing? What I do is try to sing the bass. 
I don't know whether it's easier for gentlemen or not because our voices are sort of in the bass, but maybe this is payback time since ladies are always singing the melody. So we'll, we'll focus on the bass and we'll try to sing the bass. And if we find that in singing the bass, our voice is not changing, probably the harmony hasn't changed. If we have to sing a different pitch, then probably the harmony has changed. So let's try that as an initial modus operandi here and we'll see how it works. So here's an example from Wagner. See if you can find the pitch. Sing it. I want to hear the sound. Louder, please. Did it change? No. He keeps that same E flat chord for about six minutes to begin, uh, at the beginning of the overture to Rheingold. And on the basis of that, you know there's going to be a very long opera. If he's going to sit there in one chord for that amount of time, he's going to go on for a long period of time. Okay, let's listen to a, an example from the realm of pop music this time. Uh, what about this one? Is it changing? I think this is Dave Matthews' band. What about this one? See if you can sing, sing the pitch. What about that one? Did it change? No. So that one, that one uh, didn't uh, change either. We're going to have some that, that, that change and we're going to work through this progressively in just a moment. I want to make one other part, point before we launch into that. And that is the, this is the following, that composers use the rate of harmonic change, whether it's changing or not changing, to sort of make us feel different ways about the music that we are listening to. Uh, gives a, a sense of what this music is all uh, really all about. And since, as we will say, so much classical music doesn't have a text with it, we've got to have some markers in there to, to know uh, what, what the composer is trying to communicate to us. Here's a famous example uh, from Mozart's G minor symphony. So if, if I separate this noodling here, which is just a kind of arpeggio patterning of the chord and just have the chord stay there. Da, de, 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 de. All right, so those are the chords underneath. Notice at the beginning, one, two, 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 three, Two, four, two, one, two, 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 three, two, four, two. At the beginning, these chords are holding for four measures or a total of eight beats. Uh, then as it goes on, here. Change, 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 changing on every beat. Then change, 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 change. Then we're getting two changes per beat. So what's happened to the rate of harmonic change here? Is it regular or irregular? irregular. Highly irregular. And what is happening to it? It's getting faster and faster and faster. So here in the G minor symphony, we feel this, oh, it's, a, it's a f full of tension, angst, uh, anxiety, uh, perhaps passion. It's driving somewhere. And one of the things that's driving it is this accelerating rate of harmonic change. The amount of time that each chord is holding is getting shorter and shorter and shorter as we drive into that, drive into that cadence. Now the cadence is 
simply the end of a musical phrase, particularly in this case, the end of a chord progression. So we, where we are a point of arrival, a cadence brings us to a point of arrival. So that's a piece of Mozart. Let's turn to a piece of Beethoven now, uh, his symphony number no. six, the pastoral symphony. Let's listen to just a bit of it. Can you pick out the bass? Can you sing the bass pitch? Now we can. Oh. Okay, we're gonna, no, that's fine. That's fine. We're gonna stop right there. We're gonna stop right there. Well, it's difficult. It's not easy. Can you pick out the bass? No. I mean, I was having trouble picking out the bass there. So sometimes you, you can do it, and sometimes you can't do it. We're gonna focus now on some passages where we can do it. We're gonna see how Beethoven is setting up some chord progressions here. So here we've got, uh, let's see. Um, we've got some chords set out, and we're going to, let's move it along about 138 or wherever we are there. We've got some chords set out here, and we're in the key of C at this point. And we're going to hear Beethoven go to a tonic chord, then a subdominant chord, then a tonic chord, then a dominant chord, and so on. We're just going to watch how, and listen to, maybe even sing along with the bass as he changes chords. Let's work, we'll hear that again. But as you can see, bum, bum, hold on that bum, 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 bum. And then the, the changes came a little bit faster and faster. So let's listen to that again. And we will then get over to here where he's sitting on the tonic chord. And we want to see how long he's going to hold this tonic chord. Okay? <laughs> You're regular, huh? Because we've held a long time there. Now moving faster. Sing la. Sing with me la. Okay, so he's up to something here with his rate of harmonic change. We almost fell asleep on that tonic chord. Uh, he's doing the opposite of what Mozart did. He's trying to relax us here by slowing down the rate of harmonic change here. That, that held for about 30 seconds, that tonic chord. Almost all classical music in, involves irregular rates of harmonic change. Um, a point I think will become apparent later on. But that is perhaps why this is the pastoral symphony, this idea of being relaxed, being outdoors among nat uh, amidst nature and uh, being in a very relaxed sort of state of mind. The rate of harmonic change has slowed down considerably here. Uh, okay, now for the rest of the uh, session today, what I'd like to do is take examples from the realm of pop music and use them as paradigms for what happens in the world of classical music. Why would I do that? Why when dealing with harmony and bass lines do I want to start by focusing on popular music and then apply those principles to classical music? What does pop music do for us that's very helpful? Marcus? Okay, it's not like, it is very regular, Marcus. I'm always telling my kids don't like like that. No, it is indeed very regular. So uh, it is indeed very regular. So that's, that's one thing. And by regular, we mean these patterns keep repeating again and again. So Marcus is absolutely right. That's the big ticket item. It's, it's 
regular. It oftentimes repeats and it can be symmetrical in that sense. Another observation, Roger? Okay, yeah, it's, uh, that's another point. It's more obvious because there's probably fewer lines there so that you can focus on the primary line, the basic line, the base line. Yeah, so there's a, 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 um, it's probably simpler in that sense. Any other observations? Well, here's one other that you might not have thought of, uh, and that is that most of the chords in rock music in particular tend to be root position chords. Uh, and, for, and for that reason, they're easier to he hear. When you start getting an inversion, God, what note is it, what chord is it, that obfuscates the issue. So because so much popular music, and particularly rock music, has those chords in root position, we can track them more readily. And then finally, we can add that the idea that maybe with a lot of uh, uh, electronic basses and things like that, that they, play, they tend to play the bass just louder. Okay, so all of these factors, particularly the idea of regularity and repetition. So let's take a couple of examples here. Now let me go over and look at my list. Um, okay, I think we have something, I've chosen something called Badly Drawn Boy. I had this in my collection. Anybody ever heard of this? Is, okay, one, two, this is not, okay, three. So this is, is, that, is it dra Badly Drawn Boys or Boy? Boy. What? Singular. Okay. Um, we're going to hear just a, a few seconds of this. See if you can determine how many chords we have here, whether we have uh, chord change. If so, how many chords are, are involved in this chord change and are they changing at a regular or irregular rate? before the corporate counsel's office starts getting on my case. Uh, what about that? Regular or irregular? Regular, yeah, bomb. And it would go on to the next one. And how many chords were involved there? Ooh, difference of opinion. So how many? Well, let, let's hear it again. I think we, let's do, let, I'm sorry, Linda, let's do it again, see if we can figure, figure this out. We wasn't planning to do this, but we have time, let's do it. So, two, yeah. Edward? Um, so we have just two chords there, just changing back and forth between two. Uh, here's another example, um, Justin Timberlake, sorry, uh, but it's a good example. Let's listen to this. How many chords are involved, regular or irregular? <laughs> Regular or irregular? Hmm? How many think regular? Raise your right hand. Uh, raise your left hand, think it's irregular? Yeah, it's regular. And with each chord was holding for two beats there in duple meter. How many chords were there all together? Yeah, I think there were four chords there. So we had change, yes, there was change. It was regular and it happened to involve uh, four chords. Okay, pop music. We've been using some pop music here. We've talked about why uh, we use the pop music. Let's talk about what the difference between pop and classical music is. We touched on this a little bit before, but let's, uh, let's play with this again. Uh, 
let's say you go home for Thanksgiving break and your grandmother says, what have you been doing at Yale? Well, I've been taking this course on music and we've been studying classical music and some popular music. And she says, what's the difference? Tell me, what's the difference between popular music and classical music? How would you explain to your grandmother what the difference is? Maybe six, seven, eight different bullet points here. Who could get us started? We've talked about some of these already having to do with the nature of the harmony, that pop music tends to have uh, simpler harmonies and that those harmonies tend to be more repetitious, that they tend to have harmonies that have chords in root position. And here's one other thing you might not think of, uh, and then I'm going to stop and I'm going to let you add things here. They tend to be just triads, whereas in classical music, we could have a triad, but we could also add a, a seventh note with one, three, five, seven, nine, eleven. That kind of thing. It gets more dissonant uh, the more notes that you add there. So classical music does involve more complex chords. Okay, what else? What else here? Um, Oscar. Pop, pop music tends to have a vocal part. Why? Well, because it wants to be popular. <laughs> it may be a circular argument there. Uh, well, okay, but, but if, if, if you're going to have a singer, what's that singer going to be singing? A, a, a melody? Well, classical music has melody. We have a violinist play a melody. If you have a singer, a singer is going to be singing a a text, right? We talked about this before, that classical music, probably 85% of it, does not involve a text. And that's, that's a whole different ballgame because then you have to communicate meaning in, in a completely different sort of way. Maybe you communicate meaning by slowing down your harmonic motion to make us feel relaxed. So that, that each of these, uh, with, with pop music, you, would have, you know what the thing means principally because of the text. But with, with the classical music, you've got these sort of subliminal symbols in there, subliminal signifiers that we've got to pick up on. And we'll be talking more and more about that. So we do have, that's a very important point that Oscar raises there. We've got text in pop music that tells us what this music means. Anything else? Uh, Caroline. Okay. If you go to a, hear a symphony of, of mid Beethoven on, each movement will probably last 15 minutes. If you put on a CD, you know, we could have, uh, what, what's the timing on the Just Dustin Timberlake thing there? Or any one of the tracks. Pick up the Duke of Earl one there. Do they give us timings? Okay, I can't read it, but two minutes and 50 seconds, two minutes, this is only two minutes, uh, three minutes and 20 seconds, that kind of thing. They're short. Uh, whereas Beethoven is mentioned is much longer. What does, that, what does that opportunity of length provide us? It provides us the opportunity to be more diversified in terms of the mood of the music. So in classical music, you can have rather wide uh, mood swings. Remember we had in that one piece, and then there was a modulation tying them together, but those were completely different sentiments. Usually with a piece of popular music, you get a single ethos, a single feeling, a single mood associated with the uh, piece, and the piece will t tend to be shorter. Anything more that we could push on that? Yeah. Okay, that's it. Yeah, most classical music is written down. We've talked, we spent a lot of time talking about that, and most popular music, or virtually all of it. Although, after the fact, people try to write it down. You can, you can go buy a score of, of, of the Beatles, for example, although they didn't design this initially with, with uh, music. But after the fact, people sort of listen to it and, 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 co and make, make written, put in written form what had originally been just an orally conceived artistic statement. Anything else, Roger? Uh, 
Yeah, oh, so we've got the difference between acoustical instruments, which are sort of natural wood and strings and that sort of thing, and electronically amplified sound in which it might be sent to a mixer or perhaps a synthesizer that could play with those partials that we talked about and maybe turn a clarinet, uh, somebody playing at a keyboard and you want that keyboard to sound like a trumpet, well, you just turn a mixing board and you can get those pitches to sound like a trumpet. Or, for example, let's say you're Cher and you're getting into your early 60s and you really can't hit that high note anymore. You can get electronically that particular sound to be enhanced. And let's say you can't hold that. Let's say Pavarotti at the end of his life couldn't hold notes as long as he could uh, when he was recording in 1978. Well, you can just, uh, an, an engineer will just sit there and, and isolate that second of sound and then give a times three command and boom, well, look at Pavarotti hold out that note. Well, it's, it's the miracle of the engineer and, and not the singer. So uh, there, uh, there are a lot of uh, acoustical things, uh, sort of tricks of synthetic things going on in pop music. Yeah? Well, not just the, um, the chord progression, but also the structure of the piece, like the popular music, there's often a couple of verses and a chorus and a bridge, and you can predict each different movement of the piece much more regularly than you can with a whole movie. Couldn't say it better myself. Uh, say that nice and loud so everyone can hear it. Um, the structure of a popular piece is often more predictable and patterned in verses and bridges and choruses, whereas with um, the classical music, you really can't predict what part of the movement you're at as well as you can with the Right, exactly. It's not, and that ties in with the harmony also, which is also a lot more uh, predictable. And so generally speaking, what we end up with classical music, it's much more diversified. It's much more varied. It's much more complex. We've got contrapuntal lines operating in it. It has the capacity for uh, expansion. It can take us through the full panoply of human emotions within one particular composition. And it perhaps allows the opportunity for more personal interpretation. Exa exactly what does this music mean? More personal interpretation because we're not tied to a text. We're not linked in to a particular text that tells us what it's about. So those are just a few, few ideas as we, as we pursue this. Well, what I'd like to do now is uh, uh, move here to a couple of additional pieces. And we're going to use an example of pop music now with a three chord chord progression. We've heard, I guess it was badly drawn board, boys there with a two chord chord progression. Now we're going to hear uh, Beach Boys, I guess, with a three chord chord progression and it's going to be subdominant, dominant, tonic. Is it regular or irregular? Try to sing the bass. Stop it there. Can you sing that bass? You sing it for me. Here's the tonic. Mm -bum. Mm -bum. Good. Good. Louder. That's it. Okay, so that's all you got to do. And you can hear the bum holding for twice as long as the other, so you get irregular rate of harmonic change. So that's one, four, five, one. Let's go to a little bit more of. Beethoven. We're going to go now to the last movement of his pastoral symphony. And I keep hitting on the pastoral symphony because in two weeks, or maybe, maybe three weeks, we're going to go hear, I guess, the Saybrook Orchestra play the pastoral symphony. So I'm spending a little extra time on the pastoral symphony here. And the last movement opens with this sort of sound. We have these pitches. Uh, and I'll, we'll listen and you can tell me what instrument is playing it. Uh, so we have those sorts of sounds. And then another instrument will come in with and play that. It's all, these are all notes of a C triad. C, G, C, All notes of a C triad, all notes of a C triad. Um, now, we happen to be in the key of F here, so that means he's starting out with the dominant, which, which gets us to the point that all pieces have to end in the tonic one way or another, but not all pieces begin with the tonic. So this one happens to begin with a sort of dominant chord. So this is a little bit of dominant preparation. 
So tell me what instruments are playing here. And then the strings come in. So let's pause it right there. So what was the first instrument? Anybody pick that up in that one playing on the quiz or the test next week or uh, on Thursday? We'll give you three, at least three playings. Robert? Clarinet. Yes, it was a clarinet up there, nice and high. And then another instrument came in with <laughs> What instrument was that? French horn, yeah. But notice that they, if we take this aggregate <laughs> to that same idea of the octave, the fifth, the fourth, and the third, sort of. So it's, again, sort of primordial, this, this particular acoustical basis of so much of music. So that's our dominant preparation, and then the melody starts. So let's listen to this. Let me play it here a little bit. has a kind of antecedent consequent phrase structure with the, the well, once we get up there, that's sort of the end of the antecedent phrase and we'll have a chord change. What we're working with here are the same chords. We've sort of gone from the Beach Boys to Beethoven here. We've got the same chords operating. It's going to be a one chord, then a four chord, and we'll drop down for the four chord. Then we'll come to a five chord, to a one chord, to a four chord, to a five chord, to a one chord, just as we were doing with the Beach Boys. So let's just continue, I think, Linda, please. Yeah, with the Beethoven, sorry. Whoops, did we, we lose our friend Beethoven? Well, he'll, we'll, we'll res resuscitate Beethoven here. How many of you have ever heard this before while Linda's getting this set? Let me, let's see if we could sing it together, and because we're going to do this in a different way in a second. La, 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 la. La 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 Okay, so let's sing this. That's the melody, and we're gonna sing Lum Bum 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 beneath. We're gonna sing Beethoven's bass beneath Beethoven's melody. Okay, this is this is the intro. That's fine, we'll listen to it. Here comes the horn. an example of a classical composer, admittedly in a pretty stri straightforward situation, using the same three chord chord progressions we find in the Beach Boys. Let's enlarge this further. Let's move to a four chord chord progression. We're going to switch the board. Jacob, if you give me a hand just taking that around. And we're going to go to the kind of music that I grew up with as a kid. It's always fun. This is Gene Chandler and the Duke of Earl. So we're going to listen to a little bit of it, and we're going to chart the bass here. I'm trying to remember, I think actually he's in the same key as Beethoven. <laughs> see exactly what it is that he's doing here. So we're going to try to lock in on the bass. Here we go. Do 
through this world Nothing can stop a do-lover And let's move it up to about 38, 39 or so. Uh, so we've got four chords operating here and they're changing regularly. What are those four chords? Well, we talked a little bit about this before. Now we have what's called a six chord. If we're not moving directly to the four chord, we're moving to a, another chord here, a six chord, um, which happens to be a minor chord. There's the four chord and there's Back to the one here. So you sing this nice and loud for me, please. Mm, bomb, there's the tane, what do you go? La. Good. One more time. La, louder. La, la, la. Okay. Now watch what happens as we continue with this one, six, four, five, one progression. Uh, do we have a regular or irregular rate of change here? Let's go on to the next section. Yes, sir, I oh, I love you. Oh, oh. Come on, let me pull you down. Cause I could do come So hey, yeah, yeah, yeah. And when I hold you, you got my duchess. Duchess of Earth, we all walk through my dukedom and the paradise we will share. Yes, I. So we'll stop it there. So what happened in that middle section? Yeah. Good, yeah. Uh, if we yeah, and then we went on and on and on and on longer, 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 but it was the same pattern. He just he just elongated each measure by its uh, same amount. So we had uh, harmony changing uh, on each measure, and then in that middle section, uh, each chord was changing at the rate of two measures. So the whole piece then would be a piece involving irregular rate of change your regular rate of change, the entire piece. Okay, so uh, that's the Duke of Earl progression, the basic one, six, four, five, one. Now I'm gonna play a, a passage of Mozart, uh, a, a symphony by Mozart here, uh, that he wrote at the ripe old age of nine years. Nine years, this is Mozart at age nine. He'd actually written a couple of symphonies by this time. This is symphony number five in B flat. Uh, so let's listen to this. We're just going to listen and see if, see if anything uh, strikes you as interesting. there. I think we're just, just going to keep right on going just to get the point across. Just let it run. So you could sing this bass. Okay, that's enough of that. So that's Mozart using the Duke of Earl uh, harmony. Um, not really. This is a point I brought up in my section the other day. There are lots of legal cases where people try to sue somebody else for stealing a song. They try to sue them for stealing a bass line or something like that. You can get away, you can sue people for stealing melody. You can never, there's a strong legal precedent for not being able to make a claim about a stolen bass because these basses are limited in number. They involve rather simple harmonic progressions and they've been used over the centuries. It's not as if Gene Chandler sat around here studying Mozart's symphonies. I don't know. Maybe Maybe he did. He said, oh, I like that hallmark progression. I'm going to use that here. No, everybody's been using that sort of since time immemorial, or at least since the 16th century. 
Now, let's go on here to listen to some music of Rossini, a uh, composer, Giacomo Rossini, coming after Mozart, uh, and he likes chord progressions too. So we're going to listen to a passage of, of Rossini and see what he does by way of his chord selection. So the point of this is, once you get these kind of progressions locked in your ears, you go to a concert and you can begin to chart what the, har what the piece is doing in terms of its harmonies. Yeah, you're not going to be able to hear uh, all of it. And indeed, you may not be able to hear most of it. I don't hear most of it. But there are moments, and there are moments that give me pleasure when I can say, oh yeah, that's what he's doing there. I might not know what key he's in. I don't really care what key he's in because I don't have absolute pitch. Uh, so, but I can find, well, maybe it's a 1, 6, 4, 5, 1 chord progression, or 1, 5, 1 progression, or, or 1, 4, 5, 1. Um, we, you get different kinds of patterns. Uh, Pachelbel bass pattern is an, another one. So let's listen to a pattern that Rossini is using here in this opera overture. So the first thing we got to do is sort of lock on to the tonic. It's taking me a while, let's stop it right there, it's taking me a while to lock on to that time. I don't know, the bass isn't as loud as in some of the pop music, dum, but I think it's dum, bum, bum, but I think that's what the tonic is. So, so don't be, don't despair if you don't initially land on the tonic here, it takes a while. So, but I think we've got it identified, dum, all right, let's go on. Right there. So you're going bum, 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 bum. What would you guess those two chords are? If you said this is the tonic, bum. The other one's probably going to be the dominant. If you ever hear music rocking back and forth repeatedly between two chords, it's probably tonic, dominant, tonic, dominant. Remember, we had that even with the Strauss. And the timpani played that tonic, dominant, tonic, dominant, tonic, dominant. So if you're two chords rocking, it's probably tonic and dominant. Okay, let's see how he expands this a little bit. So what was that? Well, that's the Duke of Earl passage, right? So you're sitting there in Woolsey Hall, New Haven Symphony or whatever, New York Philharmonic. Oh yeah, it's the Duke of Earl passage. So uh, yes, it was the one, six, four, five, one progression. All right, let's see what happens next. So what happened next was he then started to run that faster, bum, bee, bee, ba, bum, bum, twice as fast as it had been before, changing rate of harmonic pattern, okay? Stop it there. What was that? Bum, 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 bum. What chords there, probably? Daniel, what do you think? What chords there? Just dominant time, bum, 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 going faster and faster. And then what happens? The end of that was all just the tonic. He just sat there on the tonic forever. It's a good example of sort of real time and psychological time in music. You knew it was time to start clapping as soon as that chord hit that, it stopped going back and forth tonic dominant. Just sitting there, that piece is over. The rest is just a big mud pie in your face, okay? It's just tonic, or maybe throwing an anchor overboard to bring this ship to an end, whatever sort of analogy or visual image you want to bring to it. But it's, uh, the piece has ended. Even though we are continuing to hear sound, harmonically, psychologically, we know we're finished when he hits that particular topic. Okay, I think our time is up. I'll see you Wednesday evening and look for an email uh, early this afternoon about individual help tomorrow afternoon.